about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a vice detail. A professional gambling ring has set up operations in your city. Dozens of citizens are being victimized. The gamblers keep on the move, changing their locations day to day. Your job? Get them. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Yes, compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke. Plus, the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, February 9th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of vice detail. My partner's Bill Lockwood. The boss is Lieutenant Bingham. My name's Friday. It was 4.20 p.m. when I got to the second floor of the old central jail building. Vice detail. Hi, Joe. Hi, Bill. You show up yet? Yeah, waiting in the next room. Oh, funny. Did you talk to him yet? No, he just came in a couple of minutes ago. Figured I'd wait for you. Well, how's he seem? Sober? Does he look like he's off the lush? Yeah, he looks pretty good. Shaved, cleaned up a little. Fine. Dave, how are you? Oh, hi, Franny. Thought I'd drop by and see you. Remember you were talking to me last week about that thing. You hear anything, Dave? Yeah, I think I might have something for you. I think it's what you're looking for. Tried to get you on the phone last night. You weren't in. Well, you should have left a message. Oh, I didn't want to do that. You know how it is. Guess I shouldn't even be coming up here like this. You got some kind of a permanent address, Dave. Phone number. Someplace we can contact you. No, I'm still floating around a little. Mm -hmm. Now, about this thing we were talking about, what'd you hear? I picked up a little chatter. I think it's what you want. Say, you fellas had your coffee. I haven't had mine. What do you say? Okay, how about the place down at the corner? Fine with me. All right, you want to check us out, Bill? Tell them we'll be back in about ten minutes. Yeah, fine. Thank you. All right, Dave, we can go out this way. Okay. You're looking pretty good Friday. World treating you okay? Well, I can't complain, I guess. Go ahead. Thank you. Guess we better wait for your partner, huh? What's his name? Lockwood. Oh, yeah, sure. Skipper's got something for us when we get back, Joe. All right. You're looking pretty good yourself, Lockwood. Yeah, real good. You seem to be in pretty fair shape. That pocket full of chain sounds healthy. It's not too good. Still got a few dimes to rattle. Hasn't been coming too fast lately, though. Mm-hmm. He's still setting pins down there at that bowling alley? Yeah. Uh-huh. A lot of help hanging around, though. They really got a hustle for it. That's so? Oh, yeah. A lot of the alley's changing over to those automatic machines, you know? Mm-hmm. Quite a few guys out. A lot of the machines can set pins better than a man can. Hi, Matthews. How are you? Hi, right, Joe. Hi, Bill. What do you say, Jack? Not too much. Hey, who's that guy? He works out of the office. Why? Nothing. I thought I'd seen him around. Yeah. No, down this way, Dave. Just a couple of doors. Oh, Oh, yeah. By the way, did you hear anything about Tony? You know if he's in town? No, I've been working on it. That dirty Tony, he's not going to show. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, well, thanks. Now, why don't you two grab the back table? I'll order up. All right, fine, Bill. Black thanks. with sugar, huh? All right, cream and sugar for you, Joe? Yeah, All right, fine. Bring a couple of those jelly donuts, could you? Okay. All right. Well, what's the story, Dave? What are you here? Well, I heard about it last night, right after I left the alley. You told me to keep my ears open, you know? Yeah. Said you figured there might be uh, something on that new bunch hanging around a bar down from the alleys. You figured they might tie in with a new bunch of high rollers in town. Yeah. What'd you pick up? I think you figured right, from what I heard, anyway. Mm-hmm. Here you go. Have a donut, Dave? Oh, yeah, thanks. You make a fine waiter, Lockwood. Thanks. We don't get a lead pretty soon. I may have to take it up. Dave was just telling me that he figures he might have something for us. He picked it up at the spot down from the alleys last night. Well, like I said, after I was through at the alleys, I stopped by the place and had a couple of beers. Can't afford anything else. A few nickels they'd pay me. Lucky to get enough to eat the way things are going. Yeah, it's pretty rough, I know. Well, what's the pitch you got, Dave? Well, I was sitting there having a beer and a couple of those new faces were sitting next to me. So I put my ear out and tried to pick up some of the talk. Yeah. 
I couldn't get all of it, but I did get enough to make out there's going to be a big game tonight. From what I could get, there's going to be a lot of scratch floating around. You hear what's going to be, Dave? You know, I had to play it careful, you know. Could it be too nosy? Yeah, sure. Well, I uh, sat and had another beer in one of these new monks. Heard the other guy call him Mike, I think. He asked the bartender for change to make a phone call. He got the change, went over the wall phone. I got up and drifted over that way. I made out like I was watching the shuffleboard. I caught some of his talk. Yeah, what was that? Well, he was talking about some big game tonight. I heard him say to the guy on the other end not to show up before 11.30. To get an address? Yeah, mm hmm. Said he'd be back of an empty store building down on Gibbons Avenue. You get the number? Mm hmm. 9122. What was that again? 9122, Nine... is that right? Yeah. Gibbons, huh? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. As soon as I get out of the place, I wrote it down. Wait a minute. I got it. Let's see. Yeah. 9122 Gibbons. Yeah, that's it. Now, this fellow that made the phone call, you say his name was Mike, is that right? Yeah, that's what I heard his partner call him. He's kind of a, a short guy, like 35, 36, on the fat side, black hair. Mm hmm. Mike Filmer. No? Yeah, we've had an eye on him. Thought he might figure in. Not about the size of it, Dave? That all you heard? Yeah, that's about it, Franny. As soon as he finished the phone call and his partner left, I finished my beer and left, too. I had to. Couldn't afford another one. Real tough these days. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Dave. Really appreciate it. Well, don't mention it. You've always done all right by me. Donut sure tasted great. Still hungry. The way I feel I could take on a three-inch steak. I'm sorry things aren't better for you, Dave. How about a ten spot? Will that help you in it sure will, Franny. Thanks a lot, huh? Really can use it. Well, I'm glad to help you. You're always helping us. You sure make it nice. I mean, you make it nice and easy on a guy. What do you mean? Well, it's always there first. I never have to come right out and ask. What's that? The dough. You always get the pitch, don't you? Almost a month before, we had begun receiving complaints about a newly established gambling ring which had set up operations in the city. After the first few complaints, we succeeded in identifying some of the men involved in the ring and also some of the places they frequented. The nature of most of the complaints against them was such that we knew we were dealing with a well-organized criminal element. Even if a player happened to win at one of the games, after he left the location, he was beaten and robbed. Despite the fact that we had some of the suspects identified, we still lacked sufficient evidence to prosecute them successfully. The various victims either would not or could not identify the suspects. We knew the gang was running three or four games a week, each one of them at a different location, each one of them at a different time. In the trade, that's known as a floating game. After we left our informant, Dave Carter, we headed back to the office and briefed Lieutenant Bingham. That afternoon, we checked the address on Gibbons Avenue and found it to be a vacant store building with a for rent sign in the window. There was an entrance in front and one in the rear, windows along both sides of the building, and a plasterboard partition dividing the inside of the store into two parts. The place was deserted. At 10 o'clock that night, Bill Lockwood and I staked out in our car down the street from the store. Sergeant Fred Taylor and Jack Matthews were staked out in their car from another point of observation. We were in constant touch with each other by three-way radio. 10.30, 11 p.m., 11.30. 1K87 to 1K80, come in. 1K80 to 1K87, go ahead. Joe, did you notice the lights come on at the back of the store a minute ago? Yeah, two men. They went in the back way, parked their car just down the street from us here. Did you see anything else? The car just pulled up down the street from us. Two men getting out, heading for the store. Joe, just a minute. Yeah, they're going that way. Yeah, I see them. They're going around the back, Joe. Uh-huh. Looks like it's going to pay off. Let's sit on it a while. KMA 367. We waited. 11.45. A blue pickup truck pulled up and stopped a short way from the front entrance to the store. We saw two men get out and go around to the back of the truck and unload half a dozen large boxes, which they carried around to the rear entrance of the place. One of the men came back, got in the cab of the truck, and sat there. Midnight. 12.15 a.m. Over a period of half an hour, we watched 18 persons arrive from different directions and enter the store from the rear. 12.30, 1 a.m. There were no new arrivals. We waited. 1K87 to 1K80, come in. 1K80 to 1K87, go ahead. Not much activity down here, Joe. Looks like it's pretty well set. What do you think? Yeah, I think we might as well hit it. Same way we laid it out, huh, Fred? We'll wait until Matthews picks up the lookout, the man sitting in the truck. Right, Joe. Jack, you want to go ahead and grab and go away. He's on his way, Joe. Okay, as soon as he picks him up, we meet in front of the place. Bill and I will take the front. You cover the back. You got that? Okay, Joe. Oh, hold on a minute, will you? Yeah, Jack got him. Bring him back to the car. 
Okay, let's go. KMA 367. Got the car keys, Bill? Yeah, let's go. All right. You figure that's the best way Joe Tool is going in the front? Well, it's probably where the rush is going to be. When Fred goes through the back, they're sure to start for the front. Okay, Joe? Yeah. And Jack's got the lookout in our car. He'll wait for us. Right. Now, what do you think about this, Fred? You go around and hit the back door. As soon as they hear you inside, they'll probably start for the front. We'll take care of them there. That's a good idea. Give me half a minute to get back there, huh? Right. Watch yourself. All right, Joe. Let's go. They're still going. Not wise to us. Yeah, let's hold it right now. Police officer, you're under arrest. Now, hold it right there. Come on, Bill. Let's hit it. All right, mister. With the rest of them there. Back against the wall. All right, I'm going. What's the beef about anyway? Just all right, a all game. of you. Turn around. Face the wall. Put your hands against the wall. What's the pitch anyway? Treating us like a bunch of thieves. You're just having a little fun. No harm done. Joe. Yeah, did you find Fred? What happened? He's been shot. Hurt bad. Matthews is in with him now. I'll call the ambulance. Get some help. All right. All right, you two. In with the others. Back against the What's wall. What's the beef? Sure, a big noise about nothing. We're here to play a little cards. Friendly game. Just a dollar limit. Nobody ever gets hurt. We're all friends. Is that why you carry guns? <laughs> 1.20 a.m. The ambulance arrived and Sergeant Fred Taylor was taken immediately to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital in a critical condition. He'd been shot twice through the upper portion of the chest. He'd been unconscious from the time of the shooting. Who the assailant was, we had no idea. The crime lab arrived at the scene and began their preliminary investigation. Meantime, homicide officers had arrived and all units in the area were assisting in the investigation, making a house-to-house canvas and checking all backyards, alleys, and unoccupied buildings for possible suspects in hiding. Out of the total number of men present in the store at the time of the shooting, Bill and I had been able to detain nine of them. The remainder had either scrambled out side windows or the rear door and then apparently made their way over back fences. The nine we did get were taken downtown for interrogation. All of them had been searched, but no weapons had been found. Bill Lockwood and I remained at the scene assisting the homicide officers. 2.05 a.m., an additional four men who'd been present at the gambling game that night were picked up in the area, transported downtown, and held along with the other nine at homicide detail. 2.20 a.m., Bill and I were called downtown to assist in the questioning. We got nowhere with the first three suspects. It was the same with the fourth. You expect us to believe that, Mike? Well, it's the truth. I don't know anything about it. Now, look, Mike, let's put it on the table, huh? We listened to your line of chatter down at the store when we made the pinch. We heard it all. Now, let's get out of facts. I told you everything I know. No different than the other guys you picked up. I heard there was going to be a game tonight, so I came Who'd down. Who'd you come down with? How'd you get there? I drove. Came by myself. Where'd you park your car? About two blocks away, a little alley there. By a gas station. You're a liar, mister, and you know it. Well, it's the truth, so help me. If I knew there was going to be trouble, I wouldn't even have showed up. I'd play a few cards, sure. I don't go in for heavy stuff, though. I haven't got anything to do with the game. You're a liar. You can't say that. Now, you show me where I've lied. You tell me. We were staked out on that place tonight, Mike. It was a little past 11.45. You drove up in a blue pickup truck. Another man was with you. You were driving. Oh, no, you got it wrong. No, we haven't got it wrong. You parked that truck about 10 yards down the street from the front of the store. You got out first. The other man followed you. You unloaded six large cartons from the truck. Some of the equipment we found on the store. You took it around back and into the rear door, didn't you? You got it wrong. It wasn't me. It couldn't have been me. Come off it, Mike. The man you were with, we've got him down the hall. The other officers have talked to him. He gave him the straight story. But I didn't come with any other guy. Now, will you listen to me? I knew some of them there. I'll admit that. I came by myself. Now, you listen to me, mister. You get this through your head. Get it once and for all. This isn't a gambling beef anymore. Somebody's been shot. He's been hurt bad. Well, that's not my fault. I didn't shoot him. I don't know anything about you it. You know more than you're telling. You lied about coming there in that truck. We saw you. Something else. The truck's been checked out. It's registered in your name. Now, you come up with an answer for that one fast. Well, I don't get it. Maybe my truck is down. There. If it is, I don't know how it got there. You're in a jam, Mike. This isn't any misdemeanor rap. I think the sooner you realize that, the better it's going to be Look, for you. you don't have to tell me it's serious. I know that. Now, what do you want from me anyway? You know what we want. You know the answers and we want them. You're part of that gambling setup. We know that. We know who was there tonight. Everybody. We want the names of every one of them. Now, either you got the answer to that shooting or somebody in that crowd has. We're going to get the answer, Mike. Don't make any mistake about it. We're going to get it. Now, what do I have to say to convince you you're talking to the wrong guy? Not according to the man they got down the hall, the one in the pickup truck with you. He gave us the whole story. You hired him to help you tonight. You were going to pay him 20 bucks. He helped you haul the equipment to the store, and he was supposed to be the lookout at the front door. It ties in all the way. How about it? All right. Now, you've been calling people liars, huh? Well, he's the liar. The whole lousy story is nothing but a lie. All right, keep quiet. Friday talking. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, you listen, Mike. Here's a piece of advice. You make up your mind. Now, how do you mean make up my mind? I'm trying to cooperate. You don't believe me. I'm trying to help you out every way I can. I'm only too glad to give you a hand. 
I know you got a tough job. You got my sympathy. Now, don't you worry about us, mister. From here in, start worrying about yourself. You're going to do a lot of it. I don't know what you're talking about. That policeman, he just died. You are listening to Dragnet. Authentic stories of your police force in action. To show our confidence in Fatima, we make this money-back guarantee. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas by August 1st, 1952, for your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Prove Fatima quality yourself. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Tuesday, February 10th, 5.30 a.m. Sergeant Fred Taylor had died at approximately 5.22 a.m. Cause of death was listed as hemorrhage and shock due to the two gunshot wounds in the chest. Officers from the medical detail had rushed Taylor's wife from his home to the receiving hospital. She was with him at the time of his death. Unfortunately, he never regained consciousness. 5.45 a.m., while the investigation went on at the scene of the murder, Bill Lockwood and I continued our interrogation of the suspect, Mike Filmer. Another hour of questioning, and he still refused to tell us anything. We finally confronted him with the man we'd seen him arrive with at the location of the gambling game earlier that morning. Another ten minutes of questioning, and he finally broke down. Why didn't you tell us that to begin with? Well, believe me, I wanted to. I, I was scared. I was scared to death. I never had anything like this happen to me before. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. All right, this is a complete list of everybody you saw there last night. Everybody was in that game? Well, yeah, I think it covers it. Well, let me see it. Man. All right, here you are. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah, just about everybody. These are the only addresses you've got, just these three here. Yeah, that's it. Now, I'm not lying now. Believe me, those are the only ones I know of. All right, so you had a hand in the game. You brought in the equipment. You were working for the house. Yeah, that's right. Then who's the boss, Mike? Who's running the game? What about it? Who's running it? Look, I, I've told you everybody that was there, everybody. He wasn't there that night. He couldn't have had anything to do with Mike, it. Mike, we didn't ask you that. We asked you who the boss is. What's his name? Now, how about if we want his name? But I told you he wasn't there last night. If he wasn't there, he couldn't have had anything to do with it. Look, he's a nice guy. He doesn't want trouble any more than I do. He couldn't tell you You let anything. us figure that out, will you? Now, who's the boss, Mike? Does it have to be? Is that important? We wouldn't be asking you. Who is he? George Delano. Now, that's all I know about him, his name. How does he spell his last name? What's he look like? Well, I guess it's D-E-L-A-N-O. I never saw him write it down, though. I've only known him about a month, maybe five weeks. What's his description? Well, he's taller than I am, about 5 feet 10, 11, maybe. Dark hair. A little bit on the heavy side. You know, like me, I guess. Man about 45, 50. Where does he live? Where do we find him? I don't know where he lives. Some hotel downtown, I think. The only times I ever met him was at a bar. Which bar? Where about South end of town, down in Vermont. I don't know the address, but I can point it out to you. It's a couple of doors down from a big bowling alley. Right across from a theater, woman's dress shop next door. Yeah, that's right. That's a place. The only place I've ever seen him. He always calls me at home and tells me where to meet him. You mean to say you've been working for this Delano and you don't even know where he lives? Well, I don't know what else to tell you. I'm squaring with you. I really don't know. Friday, talk to you, man. Yeah, sir. I'll be right back now. Right. What do you got, Sam? Charlie Hart and I just got back from a place down on Gibbons Avenue, the store. Yeah. Thought you'd like to know. We found a gun in the back of the place hidden under a lumber pile. All right. Did you check it out? Yeah, I ran through gun records. It's registered. What's the name? George Delano. 7.38 a.m. With the new lead on the alleged boss of the gambling ring, George Delano, we interrupted our questioning of the suspect, Mike Filmer. We took him down the hall back to the homicide squad room to be held for further interrogation. We checked Delano through R&I, but we had no record on him. Then, along with Sergeant Sam Flowers and Charlie Hart of Homicide, we drove out to the address of George Delano as listed in the gun registration files. It was a small cottage in the Wilshire area. 
The woman who answered the door identified herself as Mrs. George Delano, the suspect's wife. She called her husband to the door. We identified ourselves, briefed him on the reason for our visit, and told him we wanted to talk to him downtown. He appeared cooperative, more than willing to come along. He got dressed. We drove him back to the city hall and took him to the interrogation room. He was well-dressed and, in his own way, well-mannered. After being told of the situation, he admitted freely that he'd been operating games at different locations throughout the city for the past month and a half. He told us that he'd employed Mike Filmer to assist him in his operations, and he also admitted ownership of the gun found near the murder scene. The gun had since been checked by Russ Camp in ballistics and found to be the murder weapon. Well, yes, it's my gun, but I'd like to explain a little bit about it. What's that, Delano? Well, number one, I admit I'm a gambler. That's my racket. I'm new to Los Angeles. I even admit I've been working a few games, but I'm no murderer. I wouldn't have any part of it. You said you were going to explain about the gun. Now, what about now, it? Now, look, I'd like to fill you in on everything, officers. I got nothing to hide from you. I'll tell you everything. Now, when I first came to this town, as I say, it's been about five, six weeks, I made a few connections and I started running these games. For the first couple of weeks, everything went fine. No beefs, everything was fine. All I had to do was dodge you fellas, and then the trouble started in. How do you mean? You mind if I have a smoke? A little upset. All right, go ahead. You care for one? No, no thanks. Yeah. I want to fill you in from the start. I want to clear this whole thing up. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah. Well, as I told you, the first few weeks, everything was fine. Then one night, when the game was just about ready to break, a couple of punks came in, held us up, and they cleaned everybody in the place, made a big haul. When was this? Where did it happen? Down on the east side. Punks took us for everything. You know how it is. Couldn't make a report to you. I just had to take it, cover the losses myself. Yeah, now how about that gun? I'm coming to it. This thing happens, and I figure that's the end of it. But no, a couple of nights later, they hit again. I still can't squawk. I have to stand the losses. Another couple of nights, they knock us over again. Couldn't do a thing about it. Losing all right, everything. we've heard all that. That's your racket. You can expect it. All we want to know is about that gun. Now, what's your story? I told you I was coming to it. After the third time they reached us, I hired a guard. Somebody stand watch outside in case of another stick up. The only thing I could do. Yeah. Well, so I hired some guy to stand guard on the games. Loaned him my gun in case there was any trouble. And you told him to use it in case there was trouble. Yeah, that's right. How about a raid from the police? You tell him to use it for that? No, no. Matter of fact, I made a point of telling him about that. All he was supposed to use the gun for was just to fire it up in the air, maybe scare those punks off and warn the guys inside at the same time. We'll talk about that later, Delano. We want to know who had the gun last night. Well, the guard did. I told you I loaned him the gun. Who's the guard? What's his name? Where do we find him? His name's Jake. A friend of mine got him for me. Let's see, Jake Gleason. That's it, Gleason. Where's he live? Couldn't tell you that. I don't know. I always contacted him at a bar in South Vermont, place I go quite a bit. Be a little too early to catch him there now. What do you know about this Gleason? What's he look like? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen him much. I guess you'd say he's about 32, 33. Kind of light brown hair, tall. Ex-con, I think. Either he told me or somebody told me he did time. You knew he was an ex-con and you gave him your gun. Well, yeah, but I didn't tell him to shoot anybody. I made a point of telling him that. A dumb jerk, especially shooting a cop. All he was supposed to do was fire up in the air if those punks came around, scare him away. To help me, that's the only time he was supposed to use the gun. I told him that. How much of a story, Delano? Can you prove it? Sure, I can prove it. You can ask Mike, Mike Felmer. He'll tell you the same thing. You can ask Gleason himself. That dumb jerk. Mike said he wasn't too sharp, a little punchy, wasn't quite right in the head. What's that? Hmm? I said he was a little punchy, wasn't quite right in the head, Gleason. You mean you met him in a bar. You didn't know anything about his background. You knew he was an ex-con. You had an idea he wasn't too sharp. Maybe he wasn't all there. Is that right? Yeah, that's about it. And you put this man in a spot where you knew he'd be in trouble, and then you gave him a gun. Is that right? How about it, Delano? What are you looking at me for? I told the dumb jerk what to do. I didn't tell him to shoot anybody. Punch drunk booze. Yeah. It's the truth. I didn't have a thing to do with it. I hired the guy. That's all. It's not my fault. What are you looking at? I wasn't even there. I didn't even know about it. I didn't kill that cop. Didn't you? a.m., we continued questioning George Delano. He told us that he'd instructed Jake Gleason, the ex-convict, to stand guard at the rear of the store where the gambling games were held. He insisted that his instructions to Gleason were that if he had to fire the gun at all, he was to fire it in the air, and then only as a warning signal in case of robbery attempt. Delano was detained by homicide officers pending further investigation. We checked the name and description of Jake Gleason through R&I and found his record and mug shot. We showed the mug to Delano, and he identified it. Gleason's record showed him to be on active parole. 10.30 a.m., we contacted the parole office. They gave us his address, and Bill and I checked it out, the second-rate hotel on South Flower Street. The manager told us Gleason had left the hotel about 7.45 that morning and that he was not expected back until after 6 o'clock that night. He also told us there was a chance we might locate him in one of the bars around the neighborhood. 10.45, we started making the rounds of the bars in the immediate vicinity. The third place we stopped at was practically deserted. The jukebox at the back of the place was turned up to full volume. There was a smell of disinfectant, whiskey, and stale perfume. There was one customer drinking at the far end of the bar. 
It was Gleason. Stand up, Gleason. Police officers. All right. Shake them down, Bill. Clean, Joe. All right. Hands in back of you. Yeah. You want to kill that juice box, Bill? Yeah. All right, you know why we want you. Yeah, I know. I knew there wasn't any sense running. I knew you'd be around. All right, let's go. Could you do me a favor? I mean, wait a minute, just a minute. Yeah. I'd just like to tell you I didn't mean it. I guess it's my own fault. I shot him. I shouldn't have had the gun. Shouldn't have taken the job. I shot him. I didn't mean it. All right, come on. There ought to be a way, don't you think? I mean, there really ought to be a way. What's that? I didn't mean it. No reason to kill him. I didn't even know him. I just keep thinking... There's only a way if I could take it back again, you know? Yeah, we know. I mean, if I could go back and change it, make it all different. I mean, right from the beginning, I wouldn't even look at a gun. I'd change everything. You bet I would. I wouldn't even look at a gun. If I only had the chance, you know? Second chance? There ought to be a way, second chance. You started with a gun, Jake. Yeah? You never had a first one. <laughs> names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 22nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 88, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, Fatima gives you more for your money because no other king-size cigarette can match Fatima quality. Because Fatima's length filters and cools the smoke for your protection. Gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. I'm convinced that you'll agree with me once you try them. Get a pack of Fatimas next time you buy cigarettes. Fatima, an extra mild and soothing smoke. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Jacob Allen Gleason was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree and was sentenced to a life term in the state penitentiary. George Delano, Mike Filmer, and all other principals were found guilty of violating the municipal code 43.01 gambling and received sentences as prescribed by law. George Delano and Mike Filmer were sentenced to six-month terms in the county jail. Others received proportionate sentences. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Fox, director on the executive board of the Mystery Writers of America. Tonight it is with a great deal of pleasure that I, speaking for the entire membership of the Mystery Writers of America in all fields, present the Edgar Allan Poe Award for the second consecutive year for the finest radio presentation in its class, Dragnet. To you, Jack Webb, and your fine group of technicians responsible for the overall production of Dragnet, we present this statuette of one of the immortals in the field of mystery, Edgar Allan Poe. Thank you very much, Mr. Fox, and thanks also to the membership of the Mystery Writers of America. And standing by to receive his award, also for the second consecutive year, as the outstanding radio writer in his field, and for the consistent job he does on Dragnet, Jim Moser. Here is your statuette. Thank you very much, Mr. Fox. Ladies and gentlemen, it's seldom indeed when the writer of any radio show receives his just and due acclaim. It's with the greatest of pleasure that we accept the Edgar Allan Poe Awards, as it is primarily a writer's award. All of us who have had a hand in bringing Dragnet into your homes each week are proud of our writer, Jim Moser. For as anyone in radio will readily go on record by saying and knowing that you're only as good as the script you read. So it's with deep gratitude that we receive the MWA Award, which best illustrates and confirms the high opinion which we all hold of our writer, Jim Moser. Thank you, Jack, and I'd like to express my special appreciation to our technical advisors from the Los Angeles Police Department, without whom none of this would be possible. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Martin Milner, Eddie Firestone, Whit Connor. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, it's Counter Spy on NBC. NBC. 